You are live. Cool. Okay, I think we're live. I don't see myself on YouTube yet, though. There's a delay, but you're there. Okay. okay. <laughs> you got cool. 30 viewers. Got it. Hi, everyone. Hey, everybody. Going to get started in just a couple minutes. <laughs> I need to make your moderator be. Hey. Hey, everyone. This is so cool. We're live. And we're going to start soon. Just going to let people trickle in. How do I see how many people are in here? Uh, it's going to be on the bottom of the YouTube. Um... I see it in the back, the back area, 29 currently. Okay. I don't see B yet. There's Leah. B is here. B is Stellar Viscera. Oh, okay. Mm -hmm. Let yeah. me fix that then. Uh, moderator. Okay. She's a moderator. Hi, Quick and Dirty Gardens. I'm excited you're here. Yay. I'm going to try to remember to look at my camera. But I have double monitors, so I'm kind of looking all around. All right, I think maybe we should get started. Might as well. I'm so excited, everyone. This is this is going to be fun. We're going to have fun tonight. I um, I'm Jenny. Welcome. Um, I've been a board member um, since the beginning of this year, and I've been a member of OMS since 20, 2016. And I wanted to do this presentation because I recently started a microflora project. Um, at Mount Tabor, and I wanted to share what I um, have learned so far and about starting the project and about being involved in microflora projects. And um, it's also spring, there's been a lot of rain, a lot of mushrooms out, so it's a great time to get involved in community science. Um, so I am not a professional mycologist, I am very much a amateur hobbyist. Um, I spend a lot of my free time learning about mushrooms, hanging out with mushroom people, and um, it's definitely something that I'm very passionate about. So very excited to share this with you all. Um, all right. Cool. So what are we talking about tonight? We are talking about what microflora projects are, why they're important, how you can get involved as a contributor contributor, or by starting your own. Um, we're going to talk about some local microflora projects. And um, we're going to talk about some important scientific contributions. Um, that, that folks have made to microflora projects. And we have some special guests in our chat via Bendlin and B. Marcote are in the live chat tonight to help field questions. So thank you, Leah and B, for being here. Um, I will try to keep my eye on the chats just in case any questions are coming in directed at me. But um, Leah and B are very knowledgeable. So 
Um, I trust that they will be able to answer any questions that you all have. Um, and actually, Leah has a Microflor project of her own at Forest Park. So I'll talk about that in my presentation as well. All right. All right, so before we dive in, I do want to acknowledge right up front that we are in Portland. We are on the traditional territory of the Chinook, Cowlitz, and Clackamas. My Michael Flora project at Tabor and nearly all Michael Flora projects that exist in North America are on traditional indigenous territory. Um, as an organization, I think it's important to acknowledge that since we all benefit from these lands. Um, and if you are curious, um, and want to learn more about native land acknowledgements um, and why they're important in public presentations, you can check out the website that I have on the slide here. All right. What are mycoflora projects? So pretty simply, they're a survey of all of the macro fungi in a defined geographic region. So um, these projects aim to capture the whole swath of bio biodiversity of fungi, not necessarily just the ones that we eat. So looking at all of the mushrooms. <laughs> um, the second primary piece is connected to getting, basically aggregating all the data online so that anyone anywhere can access it who's interested in that information. So when you think about why we're doing this, because um, we myself included, spent a lot of time taking pictures of mushrooms, putting them online. Why are we taking the time to do this in the first place? It's because we know that fungi are tremendously overlooked. Um, for whatever reason, mushrooms just do not get the same attention that animals and plants have been getting. And so we want to answer some questions about the fungal kingdom that have been unanswered for far too long. So that's why we have microflora projects. And there's a lot of species out there that haven't been described or named. And there's even the ones that we do know about, we're still learning new things about them all the time. And microflora projects can help to fill in those knowledge gaps and can even generate quite a bit of um, quite a bit of data to create habitat models of fungi in defined regions. So we can try to map their distribution, um, their range, and the time of, timing of their fruiting. I'm going to try to remember to look at the chat a little bit. Cool. OK. Community science. So I. Um, I want to talk about the significance of community science and how microflora projects would not be possible without people like you and me um, that are working to document fungi they find in the field. So um, I use community science and citizen science interchangeably. Some people prefer one or the other. I kind of like community science because I think it's a little bit more um, inclusive, but it's kind of semantics at the end of the day. Um, but what's cool about community science is that we're basically using crowdsourcing to um, get field observations and put it all on the internet and amass enough data to help move science forward. So you can never really pay enough people, like professional mycologists. There's just A, not enough of them, B, probably not enough money in the world to, to pay. <laughs> people to, to do this work. Um, so that's why like people like me, I'm out nearly every weekend in the spring and the fall. Like I might as well take the time to take pictures of stuff <laughs> and contribute to community science. Um, there's 163 microflora projects in North America. And that creates a massive amount of data um, that adds to our knowledge of the range of species and phenology. Does anybody want to 
comment into the chat of what phonology is. It's a fun, um, it's a fun ology word. Adam, hey Adam. Anybody know what phonology is? Don't Google it. <laughs> Hi, Kate. Oh, my cousin is here. Hey, Nola. Okay, nobody knows. All right, I guess I guess I'm gonna have to tell you guys what it is. So, um, it's a study of life cycle events and looking at seasons and how like how life cycles are influenced by climate changes and climate change and um, yeah, the, those those kind of shifts over time. That's what it is. Um, Mycoflora surveys allow us also to study ecosystem function, how to conserve threatened species, and how they potentially could lead to new discoveries of um, species for drugs or food and all sorts of stuff. So in 2018, this is where I got really kind of my first introduction to mycoflora projects. Um, in 2018, I attended the Santa Cruz Mycoflora Foray. Um, and this was organized by Christian Schwartz and Noah Siegel, um, who are authors of my favorite book, Mushrooms of the Redwood Coast. And um, this is where, yeah, I first learned about micro project, mycoflora projects. And we hunted around all weekend, contributing to the Santa Cruz mycoflora project. And it was a pretty slow going mushroom season. Um, but despite that, we collected about a thousand species and, um, or excuse me, a, hunt, a thousand records of fungi and about 200 distinct species. Um, and a participant, Stephen Russell, performed DNA, DNA analysis for about a hundred species. So that work um, really um, adds to the habitat model of, of Santa Cruz County. And they've been doing that um, for several years and I don't know if they're gonna continue to do it, but um, it's pretty cool. And at that event, um, the participant named Kay Spurlock, um, she um, located the typically rare Rhizom erasmus undatus. So that was pretty cool. Lots of cool stuff out there. And by the way, the um, Santa Cruz Microflora Project falls under the North American Microflora Project. And so do the rest of the projects that I'll highlight. So um, really quickly, just to let you all know what this is, um, what the North American Microflora Project is. It is the um, kind of umbrella organization that consists of all the individual projects at the at regional, state, and local levels. And these projects can be started by anyone. I started one. You can start one. You don't have to have any special skills, but they're an organization. They help track all these projects, um, and they help volunteers and professional mycologists who are working on projects to provide resources. And if you start a mycoflora project in North America, you should definitely register it under the North American Mycoflora Project because there are lots of benefits to doing that, including that your data is then going to be included in the um, ultimate mycoflora of North America. And then it also just opens up um, opportunities like for resources, like they have a network of Fungaria that you can store your collections in. Um, you can utilize their DNA analysis, et cetera, et cetera. Okay. Um, so fast forward to this spring. <laughs> Just checking your comments. Yes, it's definitely one of my favorite guides, the Mushrooms of the Redwood Coast. It's a quality, quality field guide for sure. Oh, my two-year-old niece is here. That's so cute. Hi, Mara. Um, 
Okay, so fast forward to spring of 2020, I decided to start my uh, microfloor project at Mount Tabor. And if you're in the Portland area, you probably know where Mount Tabor is, but in case not, um, Mount Tabor is a city park. It is situated on a dormant volcanic butte. It's about 600 feet in elevation. Um, and I go up there almost once a week. Um, sometimes I take Mara with me. Um, and there's always mushrooms on taper. Not always, but usually after rain, there's mushrooms up there. So I live about a 15 minute walk from Tabor and I just have been observing lots of different species up there over the years. And I decided this would be a great place to do a microflora project because it's small enough where it's manageable. Um, I go there frequently and um, I don't know, there's just some exciting stuff up there. I found some pretty cool edibles like chanterelles and morels and I found some other interesting stuff too. Um, really there's a, the ambitious goal. This project is, is to document all the species growing up there. Um, I see myself as like, you know, as the admin of the project, I kind of see myself as a curator. Um, and I don't see myself as like the person who's gonna document all the mushrooms, <laughs> but um, it's definitely a very long-term project. Um, and it's something to think about if you are considering starting your own project is that it will probably exist for a very long time. And um, that's the idea is to kind of look at what's growing in a place over time. And um, yeah, and so yeah, I'll continue as, as, the, as the admin of the project, I'll upload my observations, I'll help identify other people's observations, I'll help get observations to research grade, which um, so I, the project is hosted on iNaturalist which is um, an app um, and also a website. Um, and on there, if somebody uploads an observation, you can get the record to be like research grade if two thirds of the identifiers agree on the taxon, which is, has to be species level or lower. So um, that's kind of the role of the, the admin of a microflora project. So if you do want to um, potentially start a project, it's pretty easy. Um, North American Microflora Project makes it easy. Um, you want to decide what the scale of the project is that you want to do, what the geographic region is. You'll want to obviously name it um, and choose a reporting platform. Um, most participants are using iNaturalist and Mushroom Observer. I prefer using iNaturalist, um, but you can't use like Instagram or Facebook. It has to be like Mushroom Observer or iNaturalist. And I also think that um, there's one more, I think it's like Myco Portal or something. I think I have it later in my slide, but um, once you create the project within iNaturalist, you will set a filter on that and it will automatically feed in um, observations within the boundaries of time and place that you set for it. So if any random person takes a picture and up uploads it um, to iNaturalist and they were at Mount Tabor, it will just automatically feed into my project. Um, yeah, next steps uh, for setting up projects include registering it with um, NAP. And then um, that part was like the easiest part. That was like 10 minutes, 15 minutes, filling out a form. Um, really the, the work is, is after it's registered and kind of making observations and doing all that. Um, and then um, there's lots of protocols online to learn how to document your findings um, and taking advantage of um, services and um and then there's yeah protocols on like collection and how to submit vouchers to fun fungariums as well <laughs> and in the past nap has had um grants available for 
mainly DNA sequencing, and they're not available at the moment, but they could be in the future. So if you register your project, you can take advantage of those grants, potentially. Cool. So if starting your own microflora project is a little overwhelming, maybe you just want to kind of learn how to like make observations and contribute to other people's microflora projects, I will tell you how to do that. Um, so you're going to want to start sharing your observations. Um, to do that, you're going to want to start taking photos in the field when you're out and about. Um, and Steps number two and three are definitely optional, but I know a lot of people who have gotten really into like doing DNA analysis on their specimens as well as storing their specimens. I personally have not gotten that gotten that deep yet, um, but that is um, a way to um, add to the to the data that you're um, uploading to iNaturalist and that you're storing for long term, um, and then definitely want to make sure you document your observations on either iNaturalist or Mushroom Observer. And I'm going to talk about each of these steps in a little bit more detail. Um, so I wanted to um, just have a slide on photography because this is so important for um, for including in your like observation is, is quality photos. Um, the top two photographs were taken by B and um, yes, thank you, Leah. Picking mushrooms in city parks is technically not allowed. So yes, that is true. Um, so the top two photos were taken by B at Mount Tabor, um, Leah, B and I, spent an afternoon at Tabor and we made about 30 observations in a couple of hours. So it's pretty, pretty awesome. Um, with photography, I'm by no means an expert at all. I take a lot of blurry photos. I have kind of an older phone, so they don't always turn out great. But um, from what I hear, a tripod can be very useful, getting good lighting, and also just making sure to kind of how B has like here, like she's showing many different angles of a few different um, specimens. So the top of the cap, the underside, um, the hymenium, the spore, spore bearing surface, the um, mushroom on its side so we can see the the full stipe and then with the morcella tridentina um she's showing the cross section so we can see the inside of the flesh um so super helpful for um especially if you're out in the field and you you're you find something you don't necessarily know what it is you these photos are going to be crucial um for later on when you're coming back and you're uploading them to iNaturalist and you're trying to label it with an ID. Yes, be, um, so do historic observations in the area on INAT also get added to the project? Yes. Um, like, for example, when Adam Bryant started his um, microflora project on Hood, which was pretty recently, like, a lot of previous observations got automatically fed into that. So I think he has over 2,000, like 2,700 observations already. So it just automatically fed those in. And same for Tabor. Like when I started mine, there were already lots of observations that fed in automatically. Good question. Um, the other thing that B does that I really like is she puts in something for scale. So she carries a ruler around and sometimes a penny so you can kind of get a sense of scale um, with her specimens. And yeah, um, what's cool about taking pictures on your phone is that um, there's metadata anytime you take a picture so it automatically um, will record the location and the time and um, dates. So that automatically, when you upload that photo to INAT, that metadata just gets uploaded with it. So that's really nice. Um, 
otherwise, if you're taking pictures with um, something other than a smartphone that doesn't have metadata, you want to make sure you note that, um, like where you were, location, date, that stuff. Okay. Um, I think that's all I want to say about photos. B, do you have anything else you want to add about um, photography? Okay, well, you can add it if you want. Don't want to put you on the spot, but you know, you're good at it. So tell the people what, sh what to do. <laughs> All right, so then um, kind of a next optional step is DNA analysis. This can be helpful if you find something you're not sure what it is, um, or if you just want to confirm um, the species. Like we found the, the Morchella tridentina at Tabor, but we weren't 100% sure on the species. So um, that would be a good instance. That would be, yeah, a really good instance to, um, to send that off for analysis. <laughs> yes, and so for um, it, for the North American Mycophore Project, it's it's thirty one dollars a specimen, which I think is kind of a lot. I know that other people in OMS um, have other ways of doing DNA analysis, and I'm not um, as I'm not as knowledgeable about like that costs them, but um, reach out to your, to your OMS people if you are interested in taking advantage of that. Um, there are lots of protocols available on the North American Mycophora Project website. That should be a P and not an F, by the way, um, if you're interested in learning more about like how to send those off to um, for analysis. And then another optional but very thorough step would be to voucher your specimen and store it. So voucher specimens are basically just the physical record of the organism deposited in a, in a public facility so that anyone in the future can access it later on. So if a researcher comes along 50 years from now, they can access that actual mushroom in basically a vault, which is pretty cool. Um, it's much more valuable than just like the written record of the thing because it's, that's always someone's interpretation of it. When you have a voucher, scientists can, or anyone can go back and actually reinterpret um, that, that specimen themselves. And so there are these, um, institutions called fungariums, fungaria, that um, exist basically to store like dried mushrooms and um, yeah, and they store them in perpetuity and you can also store them at home. Like you could get a filing cabinet, put your dried mushrooms in like Ziploc bags if you have space for that. Um, I think Adam, who is curating the Mount, Mount Hood Mycophore project, wants to create his own fungarium on Mount Hood in his cabin, which sounds just incredible to me. Um, so that's super cool. Um, but the only downside to storing them at home is that like not everyone can access it and then something happens to you. It's like, oh, what do we do with all these mushrooms? So when you store them in like an official fungarium, then you're ensuring that no matter what happens to you, these mushrooms will always be available for anyone to access. Um, and also with like storing mushrooms long term, like you want to take that effort up front to keep the mushroom intact. So when you bring your specimens home from the field using a wax paper bag, putting them in a tackle box, keeping them in good shape. Um, so just like kind of having that practice in place can help um, keep your specimens looking good. 
So with um, documenting online, um, like I said, my project is on iNaturalist. I prefer that platform, but you can also um, put your observations on Mushroom Observer. It just kind of depends because the um, North American Microflora Project, when you um, register your project, they don't they're not platform specific. So um, admins can choose where they want to put their projects. So some projects are going to be on INAT, some are going to be on Mushroom Observer, and some are going to be even on MycoPortal, I think. But I've, I've never used MycoPortal, so I don't know that much about that. But I'm on INAT. I definitely um, endorse INAT. Um, it's nice because there's the mobile app. Um, Yes, I'm just looking at the chat and yes, um, I'm going to, yes, the obscuring of location is a very useful tool when you have a secret mushroom spot. Um, yeah, like we definitely obscured the location for that moral tridentina that we found at Mount Tabor for sure, because yeah. It's important. <laughs> so um, I can show you how to do that on my next slide. I think I have a screenshot of, of how to do that. Um, cool. So um, I don't know if I have anything else to say about this, but other than, um, you know, these are all kind of different websites, but they're, um, but they all have benefits and downsides to them. Cool. So this is um, kind of what Rob was asking about. Um, but I wanted to just show, if you're not using the Iron Naturalist app, I know a lot of you probably are, maybe have seen it, but if you're not using it, this is kind of what it looks like. So um, you can um, click on your, this thing is, needs to go away. Eh. I don't know what's happening there. Um, so there's a little observe button at the bottom. So you want to click on that um, to upload your observation and then you can upload your photos here. Um, there is a feature in the app where, which like when you click on this observe button, it will give you the option to take a picture through the app. I don't re recommend doing that um, because the camera quality is really, really poor. So I would recommend just using your phone to take the pictures or another high quality camera, um, and then upload them by clicking on this little square. And then, um, in INA, you can use this, um, AI feature where it will basically suggest what it is that you found. And this is super helpful if you're finding something that like you've never seen before. It can get you pretty close. It can usually get you to at least genus. Um, and here um, it did. Um, down here, um, it's just feeding in the date and the time that I found that. And then um, it should be feeding in location. I don't know why it's not there, but it should be. Um, and then this is the geo privacy. This is where um, you can lock your location down, um, basically just obscure it. So it's off by like a few miles or something, but it would still be like kind of in proximity. Cool. And then um, under the notes section, um, that's pretty, pretty key um, area where you can describe the habitat. You can talk about what the mushroom smells like. Um, you can talk about what trees are growing near it and what it's growing on and just other aspects that the photo isn't showing you. You can talk about bruising. This mushroom bruises blue, which is pretty cool. And basically, like, this is how you do it on the app. You can also do it on the website. I prefer doing it on, I don't know, I kind of do it on both. But I, I like to, like, when I take observe or when I make observations, I like to take all my pictures out in the field and then come home. And then later that day, I, I like to upload them from my computer. It's just easier for me. So 
So I think this is the maybe the best part of the presentation right here because this is pretty exciting. So I did want to really highlight some scientific contributions that people have made through being involved in community science and just by paying attention to what's around them. We live in a very um, fast paced world. And like, I think it's community science is so cool because it forces you to slow down and really pay attention to what's around you. And I used to be just really into like foraging edible mushrooms. That's kind of how I got started. And I'm still very into that. Do not get me wrong, but I have also very much um, by way of that grown to be more interested in weird little stuff and um, unusual things that are just largely ignored by like 99.99% of humanity. So um, this like microflora projects kind of allow for an outlet for that nerdiness, um, which is pretty cool. And this example here on the slide um, shows um, what Ryan Terrell found in Alaska. I don't know Ryan, but um, I looked at his observation on iNaturalist and um, learned that he made this discovery. It was basically this um, S. Fimbriana was the first report of this species in the entire Western Hemisphere. There are fewer than five known lo locations of this globally. So it's pretty profound. I hope someday to make such a discovery, novel discovery. <laughs> Just looking at the chat. Yeah. Cool. And I did want to call on Adam Bryant. He's in our, I know he's in the chat here. Um, he is pretty badass. Um, this is, um, you guys can all attempt this name from home. I'm pretty sure it's called Pulcherbolita pseudosclerotorium, something like that. Um, but it's a beautiful, beautiful mushroom that um, is pink. It's a pink bolete. So gorgeous. I love it. And Adam found this. He was visiting family in Michigan and he found it out there, took some pictures, put it on the internet. A mycologist got in touch with him and was like, hey, can you get this to me? So Adam dehydrated it, um, sent it off to that mycologist. I can't remember who, who Adam sent it to. Um, but Adam, feel free to fill in some of the details um, that I'm not getting. But basically, this mushroom was the first record of the species in Michigan confirmed by DMA, DNA. So way to go, Adam. Um, you're super cool. So I put some links here. I know you can't click on these links, but I can put them in the chat at the end of the presentation. But I do want to just call out some really awesome microflora projects that are happening in our local area. Um, Leah Benlin started the Forest Park Microflora Project, which I checked today, and it has a thousand observations. As of today, yesterday it had 999, so someone uploaded one today, which is pretty cool. Um, so it has a thousand observations, and um, Microflora of Mount Hood is Adam Bryant's project, and that one has like 2,700 observations. Um, and that, that project is pretty new. I think Adam started that just last month, but um, pretty cool. And then there's a statewide. Um, yes, you can join OMS um, if you live in another state. My friend Abby lives in Texas, and she is an OMS member. Yep. Um, there's a statewide microflora project. I don't know as much about that one, um, but it exists. 
All right, so where to go from here? Um, basically, download iNaturalist. If you're not using it, I highly recommend you download it. Um, start posting your observations. Start using the AI feature. If you don't know what something is, give, a guess, give it a guess. Um, this is also an opportunity to really um, work on mushroom ID skills can be really hard. So um, OMS is a great resource. There's a lot of people in OMS who can help you. If you come during normal times, we have meetings, actual meetings where you can come in person and bring your mushrooms and people can help you identify them. Um, but even um, during pandemic times, we um, have lots of resources at our disposal. Um, we have books, we've got iNaturalist, you can tag people on iNaturalist, so you can tag me or Leah or B to help you um, or other people. And um, yeah. And then if you are leaving this presentation feeling very inspired, which I hope you are, you might want to consider starting your own microflora project with the North American Microflora project. And um, I don't know, I, I think there's a lot of potential in our area to um, start more projects. I think it'd be cool to start a Savi Island project. I think it'd be cool to start a project in the Gorge, um, Tillamook. I mean, pretty much anywhere. So um, yeah, if you Maybe in the chat, if you have an idea of where you want to start one or where you think would be a good place to start one, um, you should put it in the chat so we can all see. Um, in the future, I definitely want to do a Mount Tabor Myco Blitz. What is a Myco Blitz? It is a mushroom party where we all meet in one place. Um, because there's a plague right now, we might not be able to do that. But... I don't know, it is, it, like doing like mushroom stuff, it can be done at a distance, but it'd probably be better for us to wait until normal times again. But a Michael Blitz would be basically a group of people going out and looking at um, an area, in this case Mount Tabor, and basically recording, splitting up and looking at what's um, what's there and putting all of our observations online. It's kind of what we did at, um, in Santa Cruz for like a whole weekend. So it'd be cool to do that in the future. And, um, as soon as it's safe to do that, um, we should all, we should all do that. It would be fun. All right. So that's actually, um, the end of my presentation. I just want to thank everyone for coming, for engaging, for um, want to thank B and Leah for their help with comments so that I could focus on delivering this. And um, thank you. Yes, OMS does do a yearly Kelly Point Michael Blitz in the spring, usually. Um, yeah, and I hope I hope you're all feeling inspired to do some some science, even if it's like in your backyard um, or just in your neighborhood. Right now, I know a lot of people can't leave the city, so um, just walking around the neighborhood, I see stuff like on my block. I see sulfur tufts. I see um, a grass pea prey cox. I see literally so many things just in my yard or on my street. Um, or at Tabor, so you don't really have to go far. Mushrooms are literally everywhere. Um, so I hope you will be inspired to um, use INET or another platform, start sharing your observations, and go, go forward. <laughs> so um, that concludes my presentation. And I'd be happy to stick around if you all have other questions in the chat.
my roommates are clapping. They're in the next room. I have a live audience. So thank you. Thank you for the applause. <laughs> <laughs> You're welcome, Rob. Great job. Thanks, Candace. Oh, yeah. And thank you to Candace because Candace was behind the scenes this whole time helping with the technical aspects of this and helping me get all set up. And um, yeah, this is Navan. Um, yeah, so it's been it's been awesome having you, Candace. Thank you so much. This is something that we really um, want to do more of. OMS, we really want to have more um, like online presentations um, so that we can all stay connected. Because I know it's hard not having our in person meetups. And um, yeah, so thank you, Kate and Adam and. Rachel, yellow Eleanor. <laughs> Navan says hi, everyone. Oh, we put her on big screen so we can see a big picture of her. Oh, okay, one second. The baby. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> oh. Yeah. Beautiful. Anyone have any questions that you didn't? I know Leah and B have been answering questions as we go along, so. Yeah, Amory, you should definitely start. Amory, Amory um, is my friend who's in the chat, and she sends me a lot of pictures of mushrooms in her backyard because they have a whole mulched backyard, and they get mushrooms popping up all the time. So yeah, Amory, you should definitely start putting those on, on INAT. It would, be cool to, it would be cool to just have a project that was your backyard. That would be really cool. And Amory, you could do like other, you, you could, it could be more inclusive. Like it doesn't have to just be mushrooms. You can add slime molds. You can add like weeds or like trees, like whatever, like other kind of natural stuff you have that you want in your project. You can set filters um, in INAT to allow for all those things to be included. <laughs> oh the links the links can you give them the links please? oh yeah 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 One second okay so i'm gonna give links to some of the michael floor projects i talked about Um, whew, I don't know, Adam, if OMS has a relationship with any university or barbarians. Maybe Oregon State. I'm not, I'm not a hundred percent sure. And I guess I should put my my own project link in here. Hold on one second. <laughs> so 
someone wants to know where those bleed, where bleeds are. Yeah. Grand Furs, um, the area where I am, I'm coming to you live from, from Mount Hood. Um, this picture behind me is, is actually, um, east side of Hood. So this is pretty prime bully habitat right here behind me. I know there's like a river, but, um, mixed conifer and grand fir. Um, good question, Steve. Nice. Um, is there a microflora project focusing on Northeast Oregon currently? No, there's just, um, like the overall Oregon microflora project and, um, that one's so big and I honestly, I don't know much about that one, but I don't think there's one in, for like Northeast Oregon yet. And I'm gonna add the Mount Tabor link here. Yeah, totally, Rob. You can upload photos um, without an ID and someone else can ID it for you. I would recommend if you don't know the ID, but if you know it's fungi, you can still identify it as fungi, like kingdom fungi. So that's a helpful starting point. Um, and then somebody can suggest a genus or a species from there. And like, Rob, feel free to tag people in OMS in your comments. You can tag people on your INA, INA observations and they can, they'll get pinged and um, they can help you. Yeah, Sue, Sue, you're kind of in the same boat as Amory. Like, it would be very cool to catalog your land. Um, yeah. Yeah, Lee and B are, are super users. They help me a lot. <laughs> they actually know what they're doing when it comes to ID, 100%. Maybe not 100%, but they are very active users and they can help you identify your things. Even if you have not that great of a photo, they're still pretty good. It's kind of amazing. I don't know how they do it. I wish we could all hang out. I miss mushroom people. I wish we could have a lively party after this. <laughs> I'm look I'm definitely looking forward to to having like in-person meetings again where we can actually like bring our mushrooms and talk about them and look at them in person. That's my favorite part about um, OMAS meetings is the ID table because people just bring in like what random stuff they find and they can walk around the table and look at all the mushrooms and usually Leah is frantically running around the table IDing everything. <laughs> oh, hey, Jesse. Yeah, it's, it's so much fun. I miss everyone. <laughs> I'm so glad you all came. This was so much fun. I'm super glad. I had lots of mush friends, lots of lots of cool uh, mess people. Thanks everyone for coming. This was a blast. So get on iNet, start using it if you're not already. I know, me too. I miss my nerds. Cool. Yeah. And connect with me on iNet. Um, I put my iNet handle there. That's also my Instagram handle. So you can 
find me there. You can find my project, my Tabor project. Be cool if you all want to go up to Tabor on your own and just start putting observations up there and I'll see them. That would be super rad. You should do it. Cool. Well, I think maybe we should wrap this up. Get back to our lively evenings that I know we're all having. <laughs> <laughs> our social lives are this so... This was the most exciting part of my night, just <laughs> FYI. This was probably the most exciting part of my week, maybe month. So, you know, I hope it was for you too. Maybe not, but... <laughs> Close. <laughs> Close, yes. Very good. Well, thank you so much. Thank you. Yay. Yep. Great job. Best thank one you. yet. And well. Yep. Final words, everyone. Keeping in mind that you have a twenty. They're they're not hearing us for twenty seconds, so they're gonna be saying their goodbyes here. So yep. All right. I'll end the stream. And good night. Good night, everyone. The cat or the dog or something? That's so funny. Oh yeah, that's the dog. <laughs> the dog. Yeah. Okay, now we're <laughs> now we're officially over and